couple of weeks ago, in great excitement, I made a video about the mould effect, otherwise known as the rising chain fountain. Since then, Steve Mould has released another video, which I find to be a very compelling explanation of why the chain loop rises up, and I thought we'd have a look at that today. This is one of those things where, when you first look at it, you feel like you've intuitively grasped the whole thing. And the more you dig into it, the more you realise it's far more complex and subtle than you might imagine. In my previous video, I asserted that the chain fountain grows simply because the falling side of the system is more energetic than the rising side, and because ball link chain has certain unique properties that make it behave a lot like fluid. In short, I was pretty confident that the loop rises just because of centrifugal forces as it goes over the top, and because those forces were increasing as the chain accelerated. After viewing Steve's update, I'm convinced now I was wrong about that. I stand by what I said about the chain being like a fluid and having fewer energy states than regular chain, and the loop itself being like a wave, and downward forces being translated to upward ones along the length of the chain. All of these things enable the chain to stay entrained in its path, and enable the system to easily manifest the rising chain fountain, whilst minimising confounding factors such as friction, and tangling, and noise. But those features of the chain are not, I believe, the reason for the increasing height of the loop. Steve argues, and demonstrates quite compellingly, I think, that the loop rises because of forces that act against the floor of the beaker, or the heap of chain inside it. That, because ball chain has stiffness, or a minimum radius of curvature, it gets a kick off the bottom of the setup as it's pulled up. Now, I'm not going to go over all of Steve's arguments and experiments myself in great detail, because I think he already did that better than I can. He supports this view with experiments and physics simulations, so if you haven't seen the video, there's a link in this card and the video description. My own attempts to create simulations of the scenario were, well, let's say, less than successful. What I do want to do here, though, is present an analogy that I think helps to understand Steve's theory and experiments in layman's terms. The chain has a limitation of curvature. It can't be folded double. There's a minimum radius. In some of Steve's chain, this minimum radius is altered by tension in the chain, which is almost like a sort of non-Newtonian property. My chain doesn't seem to do that, so I'm just going to ignore that property for now. So, the analogy I want to use is something else that has a minimum radius, that is, the turning circle of a car. If you're driving along a straight road, and you want to turn and drive back in the opposite direction, you might perform a U-turn. But most cars can't just turn on the spot. The front wheels turn a certain amount, and the car drives round in an arc of a circle. When the steering is turned to full lock, different makes of models of car have different turning circles. If the diameter of the car's turning circle is greater than the width of the road, you can't perform a U-turn. You either need to perform a multi-point turn, or you find a place where the road widens a bit so you can swing out in the opposite direction before the U-turn is attempted. So what happens if you want to perform a U-turn, but there's something constraining you, preventing you from making that initial swing, let's say a wall by the side of the road? Well, all you can do is start the turn, and as a result of the minimum turning circle, your car will swing further over to the other side of the turn, Something like this. And this, I believe, is a similar thing that's happening with the chain. In fact, I think I can demonstrate it with a simple experiment. I have this loop of chain fed through a plastic straw here so I can only pull it in exactly a straight line, parallel with the outgoing length of chain. When I pull on one end like this, we can see a loop forming on the end of the chain. The radius of this loop can't be smaller than the chain's minimum curvature. And if we draw a centre line now, and if we consider that the piece I'm pulling is the top, we can see the loop actually extends below the centre line. Now I'll reset the experiment and I'll add a constraint that prevents the chain loop from extending downwards. This is analogous to the base of the beaker or any solid surface that the chain is resting on, which could just be more chain in the heap. Now when I pull on the chain there's still a loop formed on the end, still more or less the same size and that's constrained by the minimum curvature radius, but it only has one direction in which it can extend. So in terms of the amount of movement relative to the centre line, this is moving in the other direction. There's a net movement upwards. It has no choice but to do this because of that physical barrier. And in a way, it's easier to think of this as a problem of physical geometry rather than force, although it is the same thing in the end. Forces are vector quantities, vectors are geometry. Now, I can foresee several objections to this whole idea, so let me try to answer those. Firstly, I'm pulling one end of the chain parallel and opposite to the other. This might not seem the same as when the chain is picked up out of a heap in the beaker. Surely that would be more like pulling at 90 degrees, like this, right? Well, sometimes yes, but more often no. 
Because, as we've already discussed and has long been established, chains have a tendency to move through their own length, that is, to stay entrained in their path. So if the chain is in horizontal loops in the beaker, it will have a tendency to stay entrained in those loops as it pays out. The effect is not very noticeable at low speeds because of losses to friction, but when it gets going it's definitely staying entrained, and so although there is a loop rising, there's also a loop pulling through its own length, horizontally below that, at least some of the time. The next objection, and I think it's a completely understandable one, is to be very sceptical that a small kick at the bottom of the chain is somehow being transmitted up to the top of the loop where it causes the height of that loop to increase. I mean, have you tried pushing this chain? You can't. So how does it transmit the force then? Well, I think for that one, once the system is running, the moving part of the chain is always in tension. So it's probably better to think of this as not a push, but rather less of a pull. If forces down here are helping that first little bit of chain to rise up a little, off the bottom of the beaker, then the rest of the system needs to do less work to pull it up to the top. This little push down here at the bottom actually just subtracts a bit of the force required to lift the chain. Nextly, if it's just a little bump equivalent to movement only of part of the minimum radius of the chain's curvature, how does it have such a big effect in making the top of the loop rise? The answer here seems pretty straightforward. There's a continual succession of chain links all making this U-turn one after another, and all experiencing individually that little boost as they turn away from the constraint of the solid surface below them. And so finally, if there's a continual succession of little boosts like that, then why doesn't the chain height continue to rise indefinitely until it hits the ceiling? Well, the answer to that, I believe, is that if it did, it would be a perpetual motion machine, creating energy out of nothing. We don't even need experiments to know that that's impossible. All of the upward motion happening on the rising side of the chain is ultimately powered by the downward motion on the falling side. And there's a finite amount of that available, so the chain loop can't rise indefinitely. At some point the system all has to balance out. So in summary, I think I would describe it like this. There aren't forces arising out of nowhere down there at the bottom. All of this is powered by the falling side of the chain, because that's the only input for the whole system. It's just that a mechanical effect of the uptake of the chain causes those forces to be expressed in a rather special way. I think that makes sense. As always, this is just my unqualified armchair appraisal of a quite complex physical system, but I'm reasonably confident this is a decent description of what's occurring, and as I say, I'm pretty convinced by the evidence Steve has presented in support of this. The only question left for me now is, what am I going to do with all these other bits of chain I bought? Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.